Well, welcome back to our second session of the day, the wonderful first session uh, from Bill. For many of you, I'm sure, John Lennox needs no introduction. He's Professor of Mathematics at the University of Oxford and Fellow in Mathematics and the Philosophy of Science at Green Templeton College. In addition to over 70 published mathematical papers, he's also the co-author of two research-level texts in algebra. In addition to what I think, he also seems to collect uh, doctorates like Bill. I think I counted three, but my maths isn't as good as his. And he also has a, a master's degree in bioethics. Despite all of that, some of us might say, he is again a great communicator of the Christian faith. He's written and spoken extensively on the relationship between science and Christianity. Again, his books are available on the bookstall. God and Stephen Hawking, a fairly um, small book, uh, great response though to the grand design, Stephen Hawking's work, um, and dealing with a topic that he'll be speaking on in just a moment. And a book published just this, this year, Gunning for God, Why the New Atheists Are Missing the Target. Those plus other books are available on the bookstall. Now, if I may be so bold as to suggest that uh, Professor Lennox has achieved something that Professor William Lane Craig has not, and that is a one-to-one -one debate with Richard Dawkins. <laughs> that debate, during that debate, Richard Dawkins conceded that a reasonable case can be made for a deist god. And that's quite an admission coming from the author of The God Delusion. You can catch it on YouTube if you want to, or on Bethinking. In addition, that discussion time between Professor Lennox and Richard Dawkins seems to have convinced Richard Dawkins that he should not engage in further discussions with Christian apologists. <laughs> Hence, as we've seen over the lead up to this tour, and even over the last couple of days, his continuing refusal to debate with Professor Craig. John, we are delighted to welcome you um, to the conference today, and we look forward to hearing more on Stephen Hawking and the Grand Design. Please welcome Professor John Lennox. Well, ladies and gentlemen, thank you for that very warm invitation. Now that we've settled the question of the existence of God, I suppose it only remains to settle the probable existence of Richard Dawkins. <laughs> and I'm reliably informed that there's a bus running around Oxford suggesting that he might not exist. <laughs> it is a pleasure to be asked to be with you. and to join in this fascinating week when Bill Craig has been touring the country talking about the existence of God. And my brief is to talk to you about probably the most powerful scientific voice that has been added to the atheist choir, and that is the voice of physicist Stephen Hawking around the world. The headlines were full of it. Stephen Hawking says physics leaves no room for God, and so on and on with many variations. And these headlines were referring to the publication of his book co-authored with Leonard Mlodinoff entitled The Grand Design. That book went straight to the top of the bestseller charts. And of course, the public confession of atheism by a man of such high intellectual profile as Hawking had the instant effect of ratcheting up the debate by several notches. What are we to think of it? Because it certainly has disturbed many people, particularly young people. One young man wrote to me and he said he recalls the shock of stopping at a filling station and reading on the hoarding, physicist Hawking says, physics has no room for God. He was a Christian. And he said to himself, well, what chance have I of entering into this debate? And he said the actual effect of reading that was visceral. And it seems to me, therefore, that it is enormously important at all levels to address these questions. 
Because whether we like it or not, science has an immense cultural authority in our society today. And I enter these debates with some reluctance, because one of the characteristics of this whole debate is that we tend to be operating in fields beyond our own professional competence. And I shall have to do that today. I am a professional pure mathematician. That is my field. But of course, these things go beyond science, as we shall see in a moment. And that is why I made a small attempt to respond to Hawking. If he pronounces that there is no God in the name of physics, does it mean that all theologians should resign their chairs forthwith? All church workers hang up their hats and go home? Is it really true that the grand master of physics has checkmated the grand designer of the universe? Now, it is an immense claim to have banished God. After all, the majority, I suppose, of scientists, particularly in the past, have believed in him, and many of us still do. Were Galileo, Kepler, Newton, and Maxwell, to name just a few, really all wrong on the God question? Now, Stephen Hawking is without doubt the world's most famous living scientist. He was a little ahead of me at Cambridge. He is light years ahead of me in his intellectual capacity. And he has recently retired from the Lucasian professorship in Cambridge, a chair held once by Sir Isaac Newton. His academic distinction has been stellar. And he has been an outstanding symbol of fortitude, having suffered the ravages of motor neuron disease for over 40 years. During many of these, he's been confined to a wheelchair <clears throat> with his only means of verbal communication, a specially designed electronic voice synthesizer. And of course, his voice is instantly recognizable all over the world. He has explored with many colleagues and students the frontiers of mathematical physics, and most famously, uh, perhaps, the counterintuitive mysteries of black holes. His work has led to the prediction of Hawking radiation, and if that were verified experimentally, he would probably win the Nobel Prize. So we're talking about a very, very intelligent person. His runaway bestseller, A Brief History of Time, once described as the most unread book in history, <laughs> because many people did not succeed in getting beyond page two, brought the recondite world of fundamental physics to the coffee table. And that book was followed by several others in the same vein. And of course, these books, as they deal with the origin of the universe, inevitably consider the question of the existence of a divine creator. And perhaps very cleverly, in his book A Brief History of Time, Hawking left the matter tantalizingly open by ending with a much-quoted statement that a physicist were to find a theory of everything, that is, a theory that unified the four fundamental forces of nature, we would know the mind of God. All that reticence has disappeared in the book, The Grand Design. He challenges belief in divine creation. According to him, it is the laws of physics and not the will of God that provide the real explanation as to how the universe came into being. The Big Bang, he argues, was the inevitable consequences of these laws. And the central statement of the book is this. Because there is a law such as gravity, the universe can and will create itself from nothing. Now, the very title, The Grand Design, of course, suggests to us the existence of a grand designer, which is actually what the book is designed to deny. Hawking's grand conclusion, then, is that spontaneous creation is the reason there is something rather than nothing, why the universe exists, why we exist. It is not necessary to invoke God to light the blue touch paper and set the universe going. Now, I want to make it clear, ladies and gentlemen, that I do not wish to engage specifically with Hawking's science. 
That is beyond my range of competence, and I'm very pleased that Bill Craig led you into some of the mysteries of the multiverse, M theory, string theory, and all the rest of it. So that relieves me of the need to attempt to do, which I would in any case find impossible. What I'm interested in is what he deduces from his science. And that, of course, is the thing that affects us all. And the book tantalizingly opens with a list of the big questions that people have always asked. How can we understand the world in which we find ourselves? How does the universe behave? What is the nature of reality? Where did all this come from? Did the universe need a creator? And when you read a list of questions like that, written by such a distinguished scientist, you get, as I did, very excited. Here we're going to listen to a world-class a mathematical physicist give his insights on some of the profoundest questions of philosophy and metaphysics. Now, if that's what we expect, we're in for a shock, because in his very next words, Hawking dismisses philosophy. Referring to his list of questions, he writes, traditionally, these are questions for philosophy, but philosophy is dead. It has not kept up with modern developments in science, particularly in physics. As a result, scientists have become the bearers of the torch of discovery in our quest for knowledge. Now, this is an incredible statement for anybody, let alone a scientist, to make. Because you only have to read the book to see that it is a book about philosophy. And a book about philosophy and metaphysics that states at its beginning that philosophy is dead immediately sets alarm bells going if you have any notion of the basic philosophical issues. It is, of course, unwarranted hubris, dismissing philosophy, which is a discipline very well respected and represented at Hawking's own University of Cambridge, and I presume at Mladenov's as well. And I wish to suggest that this book constitutes very disturbing evidence that at least two scientists, Hawking and Mladenov, not only have not kept up with philosophy, but they do not appear to understand much about it. Bearing out Einstein's very perceptive comment that the scientist is a poor philosopher. Now, I'm well aware that people who live in glass houses shouldn't throw stones and that that epithet and descriptor may apply to me, but that's for you to judge. But I shall proceed at the level of the public understanding of science, which, if you recall, was Dawkins' chair at Oxford. What are we, the intelligent public, to make of this kind of thing? But first a comment on that remark that scientists have become the bearers of the torch of discovery. That's very close to the view that we call scientism, the notion that science is the only way to truth. And that conviction really characterizes many of the new atheists, particularly uh, Richard Dawkins and now apparently Stephen Hawking. Nobel laureate Sir Peter Medawar pointed out some time ago the danger of this scientistic view in a wonderful book called Advice to a Young Scientist. He said, there is no quicker way for a scientist to bring discredit upon himself and upon his profession than roundly to declare, particularly when no declaration of any kind is called for, that science knows or soon will know the answers to all questions worth asking, and that questions which do not admit a scientific answer in some way non-questions or pseudo-questions that only simpletons ask and only the gullible profess to be able to answer. Medawar goes on to say this, the existence of a limit to science is made clear by its inability to answer childlike elementary questions having to do with first and last things, questions such as how did everything begin, what are we all here for, what is the point of living? And he adds that it is to imaginative literature and religion that we must turn for the answers to such questions. Francis Collins is equally clear on the limitations of science. Science is powerless, he says, to answer questions such as why did the universe come into being, 
What is the meaning of human existence? What happens after we die? Now it is clear that Medawar and Collins are passionate scientists, so that there is no obvious inconsistency involved in being a committed scientist in the highest level while simultaneously recognizing that science cannot answer every kind of question, including some of the deepest questions that human beings can ask. So Hawking appears to be unaware of this. And I want to go straight to the heart of the book The Grand Design, with this central claim, because there is a law of gravity, the universe can and will create itself out of nothing. Now, perhaps the first question to ask is, what does Hawking mean when he uses the word nothing? The universe can and will create itself out of nothing. Because notice the assumption in the first part of that statement, because there is a law of gravity. That is an assertion of existence. Because there is something, the universe will create itself out of nothing. It's a very odd way to start, isn't it? Hawking assumes that there is a law of gravity. But one might want to be generous and presume that he also assumes that gravity exists for the simple reason that an abstract mathematical law on its own would be vacuous with nothing to describe, a point to which I shall return. But the main issue surely is this. Gravity or a law of gravity is not nothing. If Hawking is using that word in its usual philosophically correct sense of non-being, if he's not, he should have told us. So the heart of this book appears to be an assertion that the universe is simultaneously created from nothing and from something, which I do not regard as a very promising start. Now, of course, I am aware that when physicists talk about nothing, they often appear to mean a quantum vacuum, which is manifestly not nothing. And Hawking alludes to it later in the book. We are a product, he says, of quantum fluctuations in the very early universe. I'm tempted to suspect that a lot of this is a bit too much ado about nothing. <laughs> now, I know it's late in the morning for logic, ladies and gentlemen, but I just pointed out to you what I think is the first level of self-contradiction in Hawking's statement. But I believe there to be three, and I have subsequently tried to invent a sentence in English <coughs> that also contains three levels of self-contradiction, and I haven't been able to do so. So my challenge to you is to try and copy Hawking by producing something parallel to it. Let's analyze it a bit further. The universe can and will create itself. Now, if I say X creates Y, I'm presupposing the existence of X in order to bring Y into existence. That is what the word means. So if I say X creates X, I am presupposing the existence of X to account for the existence of X. Well, this is obviously self-contradictory, and it's logically incoherent, even if we put X equal to the universe. To presuppose the existence of the universe to account for the existence of the universe Sounds like something out of Alice in Wonderland, not science. Now that's a second distinct level of contradiction. The first one you will recall is the universe is created out of something which is nothing. The second is it creates itself. But then the notion that the law of gravity, that a law of nature explains the existence of the universe, is also self-contradictory. Since a law of nature, by definition, surely depends for its own existence on the prior existence of the nature it purports to describe. And I shall come back to that later. So I would submit to you, however provocatively it may seem to you, that the main conclusion of the grand design turns out to be a triple self-contradiction. 
Philosophers just might be tempted to comment, so that's what comes of saying philosophy is dead. Oxford chemist Peter Atkins, whom I believe is to be the subject of a debate later, believes, I quote, that space-time generates its own dust in the process of its own self-assembly. Atkins dubs this the cosmic bootstrap principle, referring, of course, to the self-contradictory idea of a person lifting himself by pulling on his own bootlaces. Well, our Oxford colleague, Keith Ward, is surely right to say that Atkins' view of the universe is as blatantly self-contradictory as the name he gives to it pointing out that it is logically impossible for a cause to bring about some effect without already being in existence. Ward concludes, between the hypothesis of God and the hypothesis of a cosmic bootstrap, there's no competition. We were always right to think that persons or universes who seek to pull themselves up by their own bootstraps are forever doomed to failure. What this goes to show, ladies and gentlemen, is that nonsense remains nonsense even when it's talked by world-famous scientists. <laughs> but what it serves to obscure, what serves to obscure the illogicality is the fact that the statements are made by scientists. Because it seems to me in the whole contemporary debate, one of the dangers, a real danger, is that we confuse a statement by a scientist with a statement of science. Not all statements by scientists are statements of science, and therefore they do not enjoy whatever authority you ascribe to science itself. Immense prestige and authority do not compensate for faulty logic. Now, the worrying thing about all of this to me is that this illogical notion of the universe creating itself out of a nothing which is a something by a law of gravity which appears to exist without gravity itself possibly, um, is not a peripheral point in the book The Grand Design, it's the key argument. And if the key argument is invalid, in one sense there's little left to say. However, since the laws of nature play a major role in Hawking's argument, it might be important to comment on them as well. Because I detect some, what look like at least some very serious misunderstandings regarding the nature and capacity of the laws of nature. And to approach this, I'd like to draw attention to another feature of the book which really is relevant to the issue that's faced by many particularly young people today. And that is the mistake made by Dawkins, Hitchens, and all the rest of them in presenting before the public the choice between God and science, and saying that you have got to choose between the two. In Hawking's specific case, it's between God and the law of gravity, but you will take the point. Talking about M-theory, for example, Hawking writes, M-theory predicts that a great many universes were created out of nothing. Their creation does not require the intervention of some supernatural being or God. Rather, these multiple universes arise naturally from physical law. So the apposition that's being presented is God or a law of nature. And then he talks about the intervention of a supernatural being. And what I observe about all of them is this. It's not that I have problems with their notion of science, though I have those. It seems to me that a systemic problem in this whole debate arises from the new atheists having espoused a false concept of God. And it's well worthwhile when reading their books to ask, what sort of God are you actually talking about? Let's listen carefully to Hawking's concept of God. Ignorance of nature's ways, he writes with Mladenov, led people in ancient times to invent gods to lord it over every aspect of human life. They then suggest that this began to change with 
Greek thinkers like Thales of Miletus about 2,600 years ago. The idea arose that nature follows consistent principles that could be deciphered, and so began the long process of replacing the notion of the reign of the gods with the concept of the notion of a universe that is governed by laws of nature and created according to a blueprint we could someday learn to read. In other words, if you update that a little bit, Hawking's notion of God is of a God of the gaps who can be displaced by scientific advance. Now the importance of this cannot be overestimated and emphasized for this simple reason. If you conceive of a God, of God as a God of the gaps, then of course you're going to have to choose between God and science, by definition. Because the God of the gaps view is saying, I can't explain it, therefore God did it. And the more science fills the gap, the less space there is for God, so you have to choose between the two. That is logical. It took me a long time to realize that this is what is going on. It's a false concept of God that they're tilting at. And so their appeal to the thinking public resonates because many people have bought into the very same idea, that people like you and I, at least speaking for the Christians here, believe in a God of the gaps. But we don't, of course. We believe in a God <clears throat> who's not only a God of the gaps, but God of the whole show. He's not, of course, merely the God of the deists who lit the blue touch paper. He both created the universe and constantly sustains it in existence. Without him, there would be nothing for physicists like Hawking to study. So that God is, according to the Christian faith at least, the creator both of the bits of the universe we don't understand and the bits we do. And of course it's the bits we do understand, by definition, that give us the most evidence of God's existence and activity. And the logic of that is very simple. My admiration of the genius behind a work of engineering or art increases the more I understand the difficulty and the competences that lie behind it. So the more I understand science, the more my worship of the Creator increases. And what Hawking and Mladenov are doing here is to make a classical category mistake by confusing two entirely different kinds of explanation. Explanation in terms of physical law, and let's add mechanism for good measure, and personal agency. So inviting us to choose between God and science not only depends on a false concept of God, it depends on making a profound mistake in what constitutes an explanation. God is an explanation of the universe but not the same type of explanation as that given by physicists. Suppose, to make it clearer, I replace the universe by a jet engine, and we're asked to explain it. Well, we could explain it in terms of the laws of nature, mechanical aero-engineering, and so on, or we could explain it by saying it was the personal invention of Sir Frank Whittle. It would be utterly nonsensical to ask an audience to choose between the two. Do you accept that the aero engine came about by, um, I suppose, unguided natural processes arising from the laws of physics, or by Sir Frank Whittle's inventive genius? And you would say that's absurd. To give a complete explanation which is not merely a scientific explanation, you of course need both. I find school children can follow this. I find Dawkins cannot. I wonder why there is a difference. Perhaps I'm scared now that he's descended to writing books for school children. But anyway, this seems to me to be immensely important that God as an explanation is not the same kind. I think it was Richard Swinburne 
who once said, I do not deny that science explains, but I postulate God to explain why science explains. God is, in that sense, the ground of all explanation. And so, at that level, the explanations are complementary. And it, it is noteworthy that this category mistake that Hawking, following Dawkins, makes was not made by Newton, at least and not in the context of the law of gravity. Because when Newton discovered the law, he did not say, now that I have the law of gravity, I don't need God. What he did do was write Principia Mathematica, the most famous book in the history of science, expressing the hope that it would persuade the thinking man to believe in God. But there's more to be said. The laws of physics can explain how the jet engine works, but not how it came to exist in the first place. It is self-evident that jet engines could not have been created by the laws of physics on their own. That task needed intelligent input, creative engineering, the work of Frank Whittle. But not even the laws of physics plus the creative genius of Frank Whittle could produce a jet engine. There needed to be some material stuff subject to those laws that could be worked on by Whittle. Matter, ladies and gentlemen, may be humble stuff, but it isn't produced by laws. Now, the jet engine can help us further because it helps us to see where some of the possible limits of science are. And as one of the general points is often made, people say that science, generally speaking, asks the how questions, how does the jet engine work, or the why question regarding function, why is this pipe here, and, and uh, why is that one there? But it doesn't ask or answer the why questions of purpose. And of course, that is why Whittle himself will not normally appear in any lectures one might give on aerodynamics. You see, as a mathematician, I'm often um, faced with Laplace's famous um, statement to Napoleon when Laplace, a brilliant um, French mathematician, had presented his book to Napoleon, and Napoleon said to him, and uh, where is God in this? And Laplace's reply was, je n'ai pas besoin de cette hypothèse. I don't need that hypothesis. And of course, he was dead right. If I'm explaining how a projectile moves in a parabolic orbit in a vacuum under gravity, I, I don't mention God either. But if I were asked, or if Laplace had been asked, why is there a universe at all? which obeys these laws, he might have had to mention God, mightn't he? He was answering the right question, of course, with the right answer. As to its re relevance to the existence of God, it has, of course, none. And, of course, that is what many scientists and others do with God. They define the range of questions which science is permitted to ask in such a way that God is excluded from the start, and then some of them go on to claim that science proves that God is unnecessary. That is very curious, a bit of logic, isn't it? And they often fail to say that it is their assumption, their atheist worldview, not science as such, that excludes God. I hope you've noticed, by the way, ladies and gentlemen, that the scientists didn't put the universe there. Indeed, I'm often tempted to reflect, because it keeps one humble, that any scientist studies a given with a given. The universe is a given. The human mind is a given. So we ought to be humble enough to realize that what we're doing is studying a given with a given. But if scientists didn't put the universe there, neither did their theories nor the laws. And yet Hawking seems to suggest they did. Is the unified theory so compelling, he wrote in a brief history of time, that it brings about its own existence? There's the self-contradictory self-reference again. Now, much as I find it hard to believe, Hawking claims that all is necessary to create the universe is the law of gravity. And when he was asked on Larry King Live, which I believe is an American TV program, where gravity came from, he answered, M-theory. 
So gravity comes from theory. That's where it comes from. Well, to say that a theory or a physical law could bring anything into existence is surely to misunderstand what theory is. Scientists construct theories involving mathematical laws to describe natural phenomena. But on their own, those theories and laws cannot cause anything, let alone create it. It's delightfully ironic, isn't it, that it was done other than William Paley, who pointed this out a long time ago. He's speaking of the person who just stumbled on a watch on the heath, the famous story. He says that such a person would be, not be less surprised to be informed that the watch in his hand was nothing more than the result of the laws of metallic nature. It is a perversion of language to assign any law as the efficient operative cause of anything. A law presupposes an agent, for it is only the mode according to which an agent proceeds. It implies a power, for it is the order according to which that power acts. Without this agent, without this power, which are both distinct from itself, the law does nothing, is nothing. And surely that is obvious from Hawking's own examples. The very first example he gives us uh, of physical law is this. The sun rises in the east and sets in the west. That is a law. It is an observed regularity in that sense. It is descriptive and predictive. But the law that the sun rises in the east or sets in the rest doesn't move the sun, and it certainly didn't create the sun, did it? So the very example the man gives, Newton's law, of motion have never in the whole of the history of the universe caused a snooker ball to move over a table. It's a person with a cue that does that. The laws will describe, at least for the first couple of bounces before chaotic effects set in, what's going to happen. But laws don't cause anything nor create anything. So what can Hawking possibly mean by saying the universe arises naturally from physical law? Paul Davis, with whom I had a very interesting debate, which you can hear on Be Thinking, says there's no need to invoke anything supernatural in the origins of the universe or of life. I have never liked the idea of divine tinkering. For me, it is much more inspiring to believe that a set of mathematical laws could be so clever as to bring all these things into being. Well, I've never liked divine tinkering is not exactly a scientific evaluation. I have not liked. And incidentally, Sir Martin Rees, who was quoted earlier, he says people like John Polkinghorne like the explanation of a creator. I prefer the multiverse. We're out of science here, ladies and gentlemen. We're talking about preference. And you will notice that Paul Davis said, I don't like the idea of divine tinkering. So you describe the thing in such a way as to make it sound pejorative and negative and trivial, and then you dismiss it. This isn't science. But it's amazing, because he says he likes the idea that a set of mathematical laws could be so clever. Once I had a little conversation with Peter Atkins. I'm sure he wouldn't mind uh, me telling you. If you want to see a lengthy debate between me and Atkins, it's on YouTube somewhere. It's called Dueling Professors. And uh, I said to Peter, Peter, tell me, what do you think created the universe? And he said, oh, mathematics. So I started to laugh. And he said, why are you laughing? He was a bit put out. I said, well, Peter, I'm a mathematician, and that must be the silliest statement I've ever heard in my life. And he said, why? Well, I said, Peter, one and one make two. Did that ever put two pounds in your pocket? <laughs> now, of course, I'm not clever enough to have thought of that myself. I got that from C.S. Lewis. <laughs> and C.S. Lewis saw this with characteristic clarity. Of the laws of nature, he writes, they produce no events. They state the pattern to which every event, if only it can be induced to happen, must conform, just as the rules of arithmetic state the pattern to which all transactions with money must conform, if only you can get hold of any money. Thus, in one sense, the laws of nature cover the whole field of space and time. 
In another, what they leave out is precisely the whole real universe, the incessant torrent of actual events which makes up true history. That must come from somewhere else. To think that the laws can produce it is like thinking that you can create real money by simply doing sums. For every law in the last resort says, if you have A, then you will get B. But first catch your A, the laws won't do it for you. And he finishes that wonderful description by saying, bookkeeping, continued to all eternity, could never produce one farthing. So I submit to you that the world of strict naturalism in which clever mathematical laws all by themselves bring the universe life into existence is pure science fiction. And if Hawking were not so dismissive of philosophy, he might have come across Wittgenstein's statement that the deception of modernism is the idea that the laws of nature explain the world to us when all they do is to describe structural regularities. Hawking's book purports to answer the question why there is something rather than nothing. It seems to me that that is precisely the question that he does not ask or does not answer. Now, his book is called The Grand Design. And what I found so interesting in it is that he finds the impression of design, to quote someone else, is so powerful that he spends a couple of chapters on it and then decides to explain it away. Our universe and its laws, he writes, appear to have a design that it both is tailor-made to support us and if we are to exist, leaves little room for alteration. That is not easily explained, and raises the natural question of why it is that way. The discovery relatively recently of the extreme fine-tuning of so many of the laws of nature could lead at least some of us back to the old idea that this grand design is the work of some grand designer. That is not the answer of modern science. Our universe seems to be one of many, each with different laws. Now, <clears throat> the interesting thing is that Hawking spends a lot of time giving evidence of the grand design, and he calls it an old idea. And of course, this is a very simple philosophical trick, because it's old, of course, it's irrelevant and false. But that's nonsense. He doesn't even consider its truth. He simply calls it old. And he says it's the answer of modern science. Now, that is going miles too far. What he might say, that is not the answer of some modern scientists. Because so far as I can see, science has not got a unified view on the matter. Now, <clears throat> Bill Craig has done me a great favor in going into the multiverse thing in detail. And one of the very interesting things is that Hawking advances the multiverse and M-theory and all of the rest of it as an alternative to God. And he falls into the very same mistake he did at a lower level earlier. God or the multiverse. But if there is more than one multi universe, how is that an argument against the existence of God? God could create a multiverse, couldn't he? In fact, there are rustling hints in a book that I am moderately familiar with called the Bible that this might not be quite the only realm of existence. How is that possibly in itself an argument against the existence of God? Again, it's a little bit of a con trick. Now, of course, all this M theory um, <clears throat> and multiverse theory is fascinating. I am not an expert in it. But just to be slightly flippant, to wake you all up for a moment, I'm tempted to say that belief in God seems to me to be a much more rational option if the alternative is to believe that every other universe that can possibly exist does exist, including one in which Richard Dawkins is the Archbishop of Canterbury, Christopher Hitchens the Pope, and Billy Graham has just been voted Atheist of the Year. <laughs> Now, in the times when Hawking's book appeared, there was a letter from a very distinguished student of his called Don Page, who is a professor of theoretical physics, has written a number of papers 
with Stephen Hawking and now teaches at the University of Alberta. And I wrote to him because he distanced himself from Hawking's conclusions. And uh, Don Page is actually a Christian, and he wrote this to me, and he has given me permission to quote it to you. I certainly would agree that even if M theory were a fully formulated theory, which it isn't yet, and were correct, which of course we don't know, that would not imply that God did not create the universe. So arguments about the status of M theory are in a sense irrelevant to us this morning. The only thing I would point out is that Roger Penrose, an equally distinguished mathematician working in Oxford, said that M theory is very far from any testability. It's a collection of ideas, hopes, aspiration, and referring directly to the Hawking Mladenov book, he says, the book is a bit misleading. It gives you this impression of a theory that's going to explain everything. It's nothing of the sort. It is not even a theory. Indeed, in Roger Penrose's estimation, M theory was hardly science. And perhaps you should note that Penrose is a member of the British Humanist Association. There's a wonderful review of Hawking's book given by Tim Radford. It goes like this. <clears throat> In this very brief history of modern cosmological physics, the laws of quantum and relativistic physics represent things to be wondered at but widely accepted, just like biblical miracles. M theory invokes something different, a prime mover, a begetter, a creative force that is everywhere and nowhere. This force cannot be identified by instruments or examined by comprehensible mathematical prediction, and yet it contains all possibilities. It incorporates omnipresence, omniscience, and omnipotence, and it's a big mystery. Remind you of anybody? <laughs> I want to make two further points. We started late, so I shall finish late. <laughs> Much of the rationale of Hawking's argument lies in the idea there's a deep-seated conflict between science and religion. I don't recognize that discord. What I do recognize is the sheer importance of not forgetting history. Because the notion of a grand designer, far from being some peripheral, freakish idea is actually the notion that gave us modern science as we know it. Now I'm talking about modern science. C.S. Lewis summarizing it said men became scientific because they expected law in nature, and they expected law in nature because they believed in a lawgiver. One of the reasons I'm not ashamed of being a Christian and a scientist is Christianity gave me my subject, ladies and gentlemen. It gave me my subject. And it was that conviction that there is a God behind nature that drove science. And to say that the two are incompatible in essence, I simply fail to understand. Hawking, of course, towards the end of his book undermines it completely. When he goes into the nature of the apparatus that does the science. Science is a rational human activity. But Hawking now reduces biology to physics and chemistry and concludes it's hard to see how free will can operate if our behavior is determined by physical law. So it seems we are no more than biological machines and that free will is just an illusion. Well, of course, if the book The Grand Design is written by two determined free uh, determined biological machines, it has no significance whatsoever, and we can dismiss it at once. It is amazing to me how the reductionism of the new atheism undermines, not Christianity, of course it undermines that, but it undermines the very thing we need to hold on to to do science. And that is the objective belief of the rational intelligibility of the universe out there. And secondly, the belief that rational intelligibility exists. That is, that the human mind in here can, to a certain extent, understand the universe out there. Einstein said he could not imagine any scientist without that faith. Physics doesn't give it to us, as John Polkinghorne points out. Physics is powerless 
to explain the rational intelligibility of the universe for the simple reason that you cannot do any physics without believing it in the first place. So, ladies and gentlemen, my chief objection to the new atheism is not because I'm a Christian. In a way, it's because I'm a scientist. And by reducing thought as it must do, because there is no transcendence, by reducing thought to the firing of synapses in the human brain, it demolishes the very rationality on which it depends to exist and to formulate its own theories. In other words, it's guilty of the ultimate in self-contradictions. My very last thought is that I was amazed to discover that Hawking has picked up on Dawkins. I was even more amazed to discover when I debated Peter Singer just recently in Melbourne on the existence of God, that he comes up with the ultimate defeater for believing in God as an explanation. If you say that God is the explanation of the universe, then logically you've got to ask the question, who created the Creator? And then you end up in an infinite regress, and so that's absurd. End of story. Now that is Dawkins' chief argument in the God delusion. I can't believe that, ladies and gentlemen. Let's analyze it, the final bit of logic for this morning. If you ask the question, who created the Creator? You presuppose the Creator is created by definition. Philosophers have a name for that. They call it the complex question, in that it constrains the possible range of solutions without you realizing it. Who created the X? presupposes that X is created. So it has no relevance to an X that is not created. Of course not. So you see, the question is, in Dawkins' words, a non-question. Because the Christian claim is, of course, that God is eternal. He never came to exist. He caused all that exists to exist, but he himself never came to exist. And if there is a God like that, he falls from Dawkins' question. Indeed, I put it to him that if he had written a book called The Created God's Delusion, nobody would have bought it. Because we've known for centuries that created gods are a delusion. We often call them idols. But the question has a little twist, ladies and gentlemen, as I put it to Richard in one of our debates. You believe it's a valid question. And indeed, in your universe it probably is, because you believe that the universe created you. Now let me ask you your own question. Who created your creator? I'm still waiting for the answer. <laughs> so I leave you with this. Stephen Hawking was interviewed by The Guardian. And he said, heaven is a fairy story for people afraid of the dark. I was asked to comment. I did. Atheism is a fairy story for people afraid of the light. <laughs> Thank you, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you very much indeed, John, for that wonderfully helpful um, exposition of, uh, to get us, help us to get to grips with uh, Stephen Hawking and his grand design. Now, John has a, a rather unique way of addressing uh, his question and answer sessions, so I'm going to leave that to him. If you would like to go to the microphones, if you have a question, and then I'll leave it to John to conduct that. Well now, ladies and gentlemen, what I like to do is this. In a room like this, there are so many questions. And what I like to do is to try to give as many as possible a chance. I collect the questions before I answer any of them. So as we have some idea of what's going on in the room. So formulate your question succinctly so that I can understand it. And I will write it down. And then when I've collected enough, I will have a go at responding to you. OK, so off we go. You can see my tactics, ladies and gentlemen. If I go on writing these long enough, I won't have to answer any of them. <laughs> <clears throat> okay, that's it. Good. Well, that gives us an idea of what's buzzing around in your heads. Thank you for these questions. You're now about to...
plumb the depths of my ignorance as I uh, seek to um, uh, have a look at them. Now, many see atheists as attacking something we don't believe in. What do we do about it? This question actually is immensely important and relevant to what we're doing today. Because it seems to me that there are several areas where it's very easy for me to assume what they are using a particular term to describe. Now, I have given you one example today, is that the atheist concept of God is totally inadequate. And it tends to be a God of the gaps, and I'm almost attempted to suggest that the idea of a created God is not far from most of their imaginations in the more sophisticated Freudian sense. And we need to attack those kind of arguments. Incidentally, there is a wonderful book been written on the Freudian argument, which all the new atheists use, by a man called Manfred Lutz. I hope it gets translated into English. It's called Eine kleine Geschichte des Größten, A Brief History of the Great One. And the point he makes is this, and I've used it and found it very helpful. If there is no God, Freud will give you a brilliant explanation of why religion is invented as a wish fulfillment, if there is no God. But then he says, of course, if there is a God, Freud will give you an equally brilliant explanation of why atheism is a wish fulfillment of the desire not to meet God and to have anything to do with him. And he goes through the major psychologists and psychiatrists, and his bottom line is, on the question whether there is a God or not, Freud can't help you. And I find that useful in discussion. Another example of this, and possibly it's the most important one, it's the redefinition of faith that the new atheists have been very clever in putting around. In Oxford, I have a constant discussion with my colleagues. And what has happened is this. Faith has been redefined in two directions. Direction number one is that it's a peculiarly and solely religious concept. It's got no application to science. Secondly, it means believing where there is no evidence. Now, if you want to do an interesting exercise, look up the OED and Webster's Dictionary, and you'll see a difference between them, because Webster's Dictionary, I was amazed when I discovered this, now is an entry, faith, believing where there's no evidence. And yet, of course, in English and in the cognate languages, uh, faith comes from fides, trust, reliability, and we all know that faith is connected with evidence. If you don't believe that, think of the banking crisis. When we thought we had a basis for faith in certain bankers, and we discovered we couldn't, and the whole market froze until confidence is built up. Everybody in Britain, at least, and in America and Europe, understands what evidence-based faith is. Now, this is extremely important that we uh, emphasize this, because the atheists think that their belief system is not a faith. I mean, Peter Singer, in my recent debate with him, it was, I can hardly believe that this exchange took place. He, he said, of course, my big objection to religion is that people remain in the religion that they were brought up with. I just told them honestly that my parents were believers from a sectarian country, but they weren't sectarian and they'd allowed me to think. So I was the prime example. So I turned to him and I said, Peter, tell me about your parents. What were they? Were they atheists? Yes. Oh, I said, so you remained in the faith that you were brought up in. <laughs> oh, but he said, it isn't a faith. I said, really? Don't you believe it? <laughs> now, <laughs> that little interchange gives the whole thing away, doesn't it? Look at the concepts of faith and belief that lie behind that. Now, this is one of the world's top philosophers. I was just staggered by this. You see, there's immense confusion here. The other side of that, of course, is that faith is essential to science. And what the new atheists have cleverly done is redefine faith so they don't realize 
that theirs is a faith system. And I explained where faith is involved in science, but in their system, you see, Dawkins accused me, well, he quite rightly, he, he sussed out that I am an Azusist, and I confess it to you, I don't believe in Zeus. I am an atheist with regard to Zeus, Wotan, and a whole lot of other gods. So he said, I'm just an atheist, and there's no big deal. So I said, Richard, half a minute. I notice you haven't written a 400-page book on Azusism. <laughs> But you have written a 400-page book on atheism. Why is that? Because although atheism includes a negative, it involves a whole positive philosophy, which we might call naturalism or materialism. And you believe it. It is a belief system. It is very difficult to get this across, I find, even in my own university. Now, the second question was about uh, when Christianity stagnated a bit and <clears throat> what happened to scientific knowledge. I suggest you read T.F. Torrance in that. And he points out, of course, that there were serious problems, the treatment of Galileo by the Catholic Church, although when you investigate that, the irony of it is marvelous. Because, of course, the reason um, Galileo was attacked by the Catholic Church was that the Catholic Church had bought into Aristotelianism. Galileo was attacked by the philosophers first. They all believed in a fixed earth. And the, church had, the Catholic Church had bought into it. And the irony is that there was Galileo, who believed in the Scriptures when he started and believed in them when he finished, he was actually a believer in Scripture, it was challenging a reigning scientific paradigm. That has lessons for today, but I'm not going to go into those because I've gone into them elsewhere. But Torrance would admit that there, of course, there have been difficulties, but nonetheless, he argues in a magisterial work that Merton's thesis stands, Alfred North Whitehead actually wrote about this, and so do many other people. And I worked in Oxford with uh, Professor John Hedley Brook, who's an expert on it, and he's very cautious. But he would say, generally speaking, the fact is that behind modern science, there is this conviction of an orderly nature. Looking at it from the flip side, Joseph Needham, who is the very famous chemist and an expert in China, Sinologist, he was a Marxist and he tried for years to explain the non-emergence of modern science, not technology, the Chinese had a lot of technology, but modern science in its abstract conceptualizing um, form. Why did it not emerge in, in China? And he struggled for years to try and bring this into a Marxist framework of explanation, and he failed. And in the end, he admitted the Chinese lacked the unifying feature of belief in a creator who'd created an ordered universe according to certain regularities. So there's a very interesting side comment on that. Now, somebody said, what do I make of the fine-tuning argument against the multiverse. Well, what I observe, since I'm not an expert physicist, is the vast array of disagreement among the physicists, and particularly people who, uh, for whom I have a great respect, Penrose and so on. But of course, we're talking about, we need to be careful what we're talking about. We're talking about a fine-tuning that is observed within this universe. And Bill Craig points out in one of his books somewhere that if you argue within this universe and think of it within a multiverse, then the whole question arises as to whether the multiverse is fine-tuned. So since the time is up, ladies and gentlemen, in order to, <laughs> in order to hear my answer to the question, I have only one thing I can say to you. Thank you very much. <laughs>